Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from Dr. Lillis's lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's an author of several books, including Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation on Prayer, and Fire from Above, Christian Contemplation and Mystical Wisdom. In this particular series of conversations, We'll focus on the spiritual writings of St. Teresa of Avila, and in particular, her autobiography. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Anthony. It's great to be with you, Chris. Thank you for this wonderful series, taking time to go through Teresa of Avila with me. The wisdom that she has to share with us is so important today, and it's an incredible opportunity to have this opportunity with you. It's going into the life of St. Teresa of Avila is such a wonderful entry point to a a woman who has given us so much. I know we've talked about it before, but not only do you have the story of her life, and really it's her teaching us about prayer. It is her life. It became all about prayer. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Last time we were together, we talked about how she had kind of catechized or instructed her father in the ways of mental prayer. And he made so much progress. And at a certain stage, there was an exchange and he realized that his daughter wasn't as committed to prayer as he was. He pulled away from that relationship a little bit and she encountered him again on his deathbed. Sometimes in these texts, it's good to read the words that are there, but also think about the things that are not said. And last time we shared a little bit about that exchange that happened between she and her father while he was dying. Her father kind of knowing something about her soul and what she needed, and she realizing what God had accomplished in her father. He died a very holy death. And so there's something there that disposed her to a deeper conversion That whole chapter also began with relating the experience of a vision of Jesus. She's going to talk about visions later on in her life. But she had a vision of Jesus, a vision in which she realized that her life wasn't where it needed to be. There was something about this encounter with Christ Jesus, this prayerful encounter that kind of was disconcerting to her. And and then she has this experience with her father. And so what happens as a result of all this is she begins to try to return to prayer. A pattern that we've seen throughout the book up to this point is as she returns to prayer, what she discovers is how sinful she is. And how do you maintain prayer and also live with kind of your sinfulness at the same time. And chapter 8 is a lot about that confrontation between prayer and sin and how the Lord invites us to gaze on Him even when we're not fully converted, even when there are serious things that need to be changed in our lives to stay faithful to prayer. She, she speaks about having the courage to pray that if we do this, the Lord in his great love will come to liberate us. In the life, we experience Teresa as she's going through, can we say almost real time, this period of transformation. In her other writings, The Way of Perfection and in the Interior Castle, so many of us, I mean, that's where we first encounter her. And it's more the instruction of prayer. It's the the guidance that she's lining out for her sisters and ultimately for us. Here in the life, and in particular in this particular section, it's as though she is us 
somewhere those seeds of the way of perfection and the interior castle are just beginning to germinate, aren't they? Your observation's a very good observation, actually, of her writings. This is my favorite, is precisely because of what you, you just observed. Some of the great questions that she works out in her later writings actually come up now. And she's articulating them for the first time. And there's something about her articulation in the life that you could say it's a little bit raw. And that doesn't mean that there's no subtlety to it at all. But it just means she's thinking about these things and trying to express them for the first time. So as she's grappling with them, we get to see a soul that has recently grappled with them in her own life. And now she's grappling with how to express this and share this so that it's it builds up others. And and of course, the work is is a success. Her communities, immediately after this thing was written, began making their own copies of it, and it gets passed around. As you look through her struggles, even though she hasn't worked out all the problems that she'll work out in the way of perfection and in the interior castle and, and in other works, even though it's not quite as refined, still, though, she's pointing us in a direction. And that direction is so beautiful. And what's amazing is the consistency of the other works and keeping us in the same direction. She's incredibly consistent, even though on another level, stylistically, she's kind of all over the place and goes into this tangent and that tangent. Her vision is incredibly consistent. And we begin to share that vision with her in this particular work. It's so interesting. You are not the first guy that I've heard talk about her going into tangents. And yet as a female, I don't find their tangents at all. But I can see the process. She's so reflective that she enters into what may seem like a tangent, but it actually, it makes sense. I can't speak for all females either. But I never see them as tangents. Is that strange to say, Anthony? No, I think there's different kinds of thought and different ways of approaching each other. And it is true, uh, the ability to see connections between things. Uh, Male genius isn't quite as astute as female genius in that arena. Pulling together and seeing connections with the rest of life, which is what she's doing. I mean, she's talking about prayer and her struggle to pray and her struggle with sin, and then she talks about friendship. It's not immediately obvious that that should be a topic to delve into, and yet she brings it back to prayer ultimately. She's trying to get people to see not to be afraid of mental prayer, because this actually today remains one of the the biggest obstacles to prayer is that people are afraid of it. One of the things that causes the fear is your sinfulness, your sense of unworthiness before God. And she says, there is no place for fear, but only for desire. For even if a person fails to make progress or to strive after perfection so that he may merit the consolation of favors given to the perfect by God, he will gradually gain a knowledge of the road to heaven. And if he perseveres, I hope in the mercy of God, whom he No one is ever taken for a friend without being rewarded. And mental prayer, in my view, is nothing but friendly intercourse, a frequent solidary converse with him who we know loves us. This is actually cited in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in the section on contemplative prayer. It actually starts with this quote. It's such a famous quote. Here she goes, she takes what seems to be something you wouldn't think was an obvious connection, but this reflection on friendship, but she uses it over and against the fear that people have with prayer. And she's kind of inviting us, if you can look at it as a friend, in terms of friendship, this practice that seems so daunting and so difficult really is something that is extremely natural. In fact, if you look at it as friendship, you will not only engage in the practice of prayer, but you'll also 
through the practice of prayer, begin to work on a life of conversion. So you made a good point, Chris. The tangents she goes into are not without their purpose and in such wise that maybe you don't call them tangents. But in this chapter and the next chapter, we're going to actually be looking at her conversion over to consistent life of contemplative prayer rooted in personal conversion. This happens in the next two chapters. And once this has happened, she takes a huge diversion in her book and she spends the next several chapters unfolding a theology of prayer before she goes back to her life. And somebody who said, well, I just want to know about her life. Why is she going into prayer? Well, you would lose the most valuable thing, the four waters of prayer that she's about to induct us into is so classically her teaching that the church would be deprived if she didn't take this so-called diversion or, or tangent. So her tangents are all very important, Chris. It seems to have been expressed by so many others, but just what you articulate and you see so clearly, Anthony, that she can't go on with the rest of her life because you won't understand the rest of her life if you don't get what she's been transformed into. It's like the Eucharist. We're not a Eucharistic people if we don't believe in the power of transformation and this enlightenment that she seems to have had, this moment, this pinging of understanding of prayer. I can't tell you about the rest of myself until you understand me. And this is what the prayer is. Does that make sense? Your insight is absolutely beautiful and good. If we speak about this kind of going into tangents, it's the tangents of a soul that keeps a consistent breath of wisdom ever before us. Sometimes speakers can go into meaningless tangents. I'm guilty of this myself, where you get caught up in a story or something and you forgot what the main point was supposed to be. Well, you will see in her writings, actually throughout her writings every once in a while, her catching herself doing that. Mm -hmm. But then she pulls it back. And when she pulls it back, all of a sudden the beauty of what she just did, the beauty of her tangent, the meaningfulness of it, discloses itself, whereas lesser minds will go off into a tangent, uh, forget why we got there, and then we we can't meaningfully pull it back to what, (laughs) what we were meant to talk about to begin with. She has this other kind of genius operating that sees the whole and keeps everything rooted in him. What is the whole? What is the horizon of wisdom that she opens us up to? It's Jesus, and she is completely focused on him throughout it all. See, I just did it myself by taking us on a tangent on tangents. So <laughs> yes. The reason I brought that up is that you can see at this point in chapter eight is this moment, I think, of a woman who is middle-aged and she has been going back and reflecting on key moments in her life that tra- has transformed her. I bring that up because I think that's important for anyone, male, female, to do that as we grow in the spiritual life, to have those times where we go back and we begin to say, oh, wow, look at that moment. And in her case, she says it pretty early in this chapter, 20 years have gone by. And I look back on what, what's happened, and I think, oh, my goodness. I just think it's a fascinating section in the book. One of the things, and you could say it's kind of a technique in prayer, that she has inductively led us into. It's very legitimate and a very helpful thing, as you said. Our tradition calls this kind of technique or method for entering into contemplation. Our tradition calls it the general consciousness examine, I've heard it called, where you look back over your whole life and you see how, on one hand, how has God intervened in my life? And on the other hand, How have I resisted him? What were things that I did and what were things that happened to me? And how did God work in those things, those the evil things that happened to me and the evil things I did, the good things that happened to me and the good things I did? How was God at work in all of that? And uh, you can pick up a number of different threads when you do this, but the idea is to be able 
to recognize that there are patterns of grace in your life, uh, patterns of ways that God has intervened. And in those patterns, there's something to be thankful to God about. But in those patterns also, there is hints, uh, signs about how to respond to him better. And this is what she's trying to do with us in this part of her consciousness examine, if you'd like to call it that. She's kind of recalling that her fearfulness of God, precisely because she was trapped by sin. And she's recalling how easy it is when you're under sin, trapped in the way you are, to want to give up prayer because it's really hard to continue with one thing in your life and to see the goodness of God on the other hand. It's, it's hard to hold both of those things together at the same time. And yet she's making the case in this chapter in particular to go ahead and suffer that because if you will, the Lord, he's going to give you something. He's going to open up something. He's, he's going to give you access to some gifts, she calls them consolations, that you could never receive if you didn't persevere in prayer. So even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's difficult, if only you will persevere in prayer, God is waiting to give you something. In fact, he wants to give you something. He sees your sin and he's not so angry with you as you might think. He sees your sin, his heart is broken, and he wants to deliver you. Keep your eyes fixed on your deliverer. That's kind of the message of this chapter. She, she actually prays this prayer. O oh, infinite goodness of my God, it is thus that I seem to see my, both myself and you. O oh, joy of the angels, how I long when I think of this to be wholly consumed in love for you. How true it is that you do bear with those who cannot bear you to be with them. Oh, how good a friend you are, my Lord. How you do comfort us and suffer us and wait until our nature becomes more like yours. And meanwhile, bears with it as it is. You do remember the times when we love you, my Lord. And when for a moment we repent, you do forget how we have offended you. I have seen this clearly in my own life, and I cannot conceive, my Creator, why the whole world does not strive to draw near to you in this intimate friendship. You see what she's inviting us into, this struggle with sin that has us imprisoned for her. This is not an obstacle to mental prayer. It's what occasions it. When we are aware of our sinfulness and how much we need the Lord, Teresa of Avila opens up. She sees his mercy waiting to come to us if only we'll persevere in prayer. She talks about people being afraid. There's a fear of entering into prayer. I would dare say a, a lot of people that they don't recognize their fear. They don't necessarily maybe see it as fear. Yes, and this is part of the reason why we entering into interior prayer or mental prayer becomes an important exercise is we don't realize how driven we are by fear or resentment in our lives. And insofar as we driven, we are driven by fear or resentment, we're not free to act in the love of God. We might be Christians. We might be going to Mass and doing all the things good Catholics are supposed to be doing. But we'll notice that our spiritual life isn't as free as maybe God would like it to be for us. This is exactly what Teresa of Avila experienced. She is trapped by sin, which means you're kind of trapped by being driven 
by either anxiety or resentment. That you have desires for things that are not quite noble and they're kind of stirring you up in ways that are robbing you of peace. If a soul will enter into silence, it will begin to recognize these fears and will have an opportunity to surrender them to the Lord. It will be able to recognize its resentments and surrender those to the Lord. It will begin to recognize things that are not so noble in it, things it desires that are not noble, and surrender to those things to the Lord. When a soul is not recollected, when it doesn't enter into silence before the Lord, it's driven by all these things anyway. But the, the difference is that it doesn't know that they're there. It doesn't know how it's driving them. And that's precisely what robs it of its freedom. When you see these things, it's not that you're instantly freed, but you begin to avail yourself of the freedom that we're meant to have in Christ. Whenever you offer something up to the Lord that's holding you back, and that's the pathway that she's trying to open us up to in this particular chapter. She says that we should spend a minimum of two hours in prayer a day for the Lord to be able to do this. Because our culture lacks good virtues of prayer, this sounds like an outstanding amount of time. But it really isn't that much time. The way we let life events drive us sometimes robs us of the stillness that we need to be able to thrive as human beings. Can I throw in something out at you, Anthony? It's probably not a fair thing, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> Talk about prayer, and she talks about that silence, to be with a friend, right, and to relate with the friend, the things, and with, with Christ in particular, in this case, what it is we're experiencing and what we're having in this, this divine communication is that the same thing is that type of activity that can happen, for example, and I'm just going to pull out a, a thought. I'm working in a parish or I'm on a prayer team and we get together and everybody gets a piece of paper and we all recite the paper of a poem of a prayer. And then we say, okay, that was our prayer for the day. And there, there isn't that silence. There isn't that time. We've all just recited off a piece of paper. I suppose it, it depends on the disposition of the people that come to it, but that can be a real challenge today. And I'm not just trying to pick on ministries or parish, but ultimately they're called to be the leaders. If we don't have that type of a little bit deeper, it's going to be difficult to pass that on to others, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think there are two things. The kind of prayer that we're talking about emphasizes interior devotion of heart. We're talking about our innermost being, reaching out for, calling out to God, and allowing your innermost being the time it needs to call out to God, uh, to rest in his presence. And so oftentimes, you know, we're in a ministry situation, the, a meeting is about to begin or something like that, and everybody knows we ought to pray. And sometimes a short vocal prayer is, is appropriate. Sometimes everybody saying it together is good. And sometimes a poem that fills us with a beautiful thought is also, um, you know, I don't want to knock those things at all. In fact, if it's done right, vocal prayer, even the most basic vocal prayer, the sign of the cross, for example, opens you up to these interior dispositions of heart. This is what you were just saying, Chris. That's not to be knocked at all. On the other hand, today we are going through something in the United States called the Eucharistic Revival. The U.S. bishops have invited the church to rediscover the gift of the Eucharist in our daily lives. And we can surely rediscover this gift by going to Mass more often and being more engaged with our hearts and our minds and what's going on at the altar and attending to the readings and participating in the Eucharistic prayer. We can sh for sure receive Jesus more profoundly if we're going to confession and living penitential lives where we're striving to love one another 
and striving to love those whom God entrusts to us, including the poor. This is all part of this Eucharistic revival. Besides participating in the sacrifice of the Mass and listening to the readings, besides receiving Holy Communion in a more worthy and thoughtful manner, another thing that we can be doing involves this act of mental prayer. After we receive Holy Communion, and and sometimes we extend it long after Mass, we can spend time adoring Jesus, who in the Blessed Sacrament has fed us with himself, has strengthened our hearts. To allow Jesus to strengthen your heart, that just takes time. It takes kind of sitting with him and allowing him to communicate into you the truth of the Father's goodness. And that doesn't happen all at once. I mean, Jesus would love to give it to you all at once, but your poor little frail human nature can only take so much at each moment. So it takes time to spend with him and to help us make that time that we need to fully receive Jesus. The church has proposed Eucharistic adoration. And I know people who have taken an hour each week to adore the Lord and it has blessed their their families and their own lives in tremendous ways. I, I know people who spend an hour of Eucharistic adoration every day. And again, what a tremendous gift they are. Not only are their own lives holy lives, but they're a blessing for other people. They have a kind of peace in them because they worked to spend this time with the Lord. I know certain priests and religious who actually spend many more hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament every day. And because they take that time before the Lord, a kind of wisdom is given into their heart that speaks into the most difficult situations that you could possibly face in this life. Right now, Chris, a few months ago, you and I went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land with the community of the Beatitudes, Sister Magdalene, who's the translator for Father Jacques Philippe. She kind of led us in this beautiful pathway, footsteps of the prophet Elijah, went all over the Holy Land. And our last date brought us to the community of the Beatitudes, their convent in Emmaus, the place where the, the disciples recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. What struck me most about that community, I spent time with them before and after the pilgrimage, was the amount of time they spent in adoration before and after Mass, just in silence, in the darkness, waiting on the Lord. That community, as you know right now, is uh, in the Holy Land, and the Holy Land has again erupted in violence. The Beatitudes try to be a bridge between the Christian world and the Jewish world. They are peacemakers between Jews and Palestinians. The exact wound that's kind of erupted right now with the most horrific and gratuitous violence I think we've had in our lifetimes. And there, right there, is this group of people who wait on the Lord and enter deep into his silence who know depths of his mercy that could not be known unless you spend long hours in prayer. Teresa of Avila, in her work right now, and she's inviting us to spend two hours a day in silent prayer, silent mental prayer. She's inviting us to tap these same resources. And she's saying, basically in this chapter, you know, you don't need to wait until your life is together to do this. You can begin right now. And when you do, it opens a door to blessings and consolations. I would add, it's blessings and consolations for yourself because as you spend this time in prayer, the goodness of the Father fills your heart and strengthens your heart, makes your heart strong right in the face of evil. But it's also true that when you spend this time of prayer, even when your life isn't together, even when you're still trapped by sin, when you spend this kind of time in prayer, there are blessings and consolations that come in you and through you to others who need it the most. And um, 
our brothers and sisters right now who are in the Holy Land, who are trying to be peacemakers, who are trying to be the hands and feet and faces of mercy where mercy is most needed, who are risking their lives in order that love and not hatred triumph in that Holy Land, in this land of Israel. These brothers and sisters of ours would not be able to do that without this kind of life of prayer. They're kind of a witness to us that we too should be living like this because our communities and our places, our neighborhoods, our families, they need these consolations and blessings as well. That's so beautifully said, Anthony. In my comment, I guess what I was trying to get at is you just described it at the heart of it is the that difference between the perfunctory action of okay I'm going to do this and I'm going to read it and maybe just gliding over the surface where Teresa and, and you would take us so that if you do read the poem or if you are handed the sheet for you you're seeing and encountering your friend that you can hear him speaking to you in that moment, and he wants to listen to you as well. Even if you're in the meeting, wherever that might be, that he's just that constant presence who wants to have that engagement, that relationship with you. This is awesome. And this chapter kind of ends with confession and homilies. And I think the perfunctory prayer kind of happens when we're not really dealing with sin in our lives. And this whole chapter has been about, she's realized that she's trapped by sin. She's imprisoned by it. She's realized that mental prayer is kind of opening the door to God so that he can give you freedom. And she actually uses that language. Uh, she realizes that, that sin, though, keeps you bound. And perfunctory prayer, where it's just kind of a nice thought and a word, that's kind of spilled out in the moment. Usually what's behind it is we're not able to enter into a deeper silence and stillness before the presence of God. And usually that's because we haven't really dealt with sin in our lives. Confession, she describes confession helping her. Penance helps us. We're going to see that uh, later on. We're going to see how important penance becomes little acts of self-denial and so forth. Long periods of prayer help us. At the end of this chapter, though, she turns her attention to something that I think is really important. It can be a great tool. It can become a distraction, but it can be a great tool. And that is, if you find somebody who really knows how to preach, good homilies help us enter into prayer, stay in prayer. They help us confess our sins and they help us keep our eyes on Jesus so that he can open the door and lead us out of this, the prison that keeps us bound. As we're coming to a close, I couldn't help but think, Anthony, of a person that I encountered over probably a decade or so ago. It was a lovely woman, a part of a lovely group of women who wanted to get together and read books about prayer and everything. And she was literally shocked one day when I said something that, and I was kind of surprised that she had a strong, a visceral reaction to. We were talking about diets, of all things. And I said, well, just ask the Lord to ask, you know, just turn to him and say, should I eat this or shouldn't I? How should I move next in this? What's the best plan for me? And she stopped and she said, oh, that, no, God doesn't care about that. Oh, I'm not going to go to God for those kind. He doesn't care about those little things. He's so much bigger than all that. And her genuine response to all of those things, and this is a woman who was a devout Catholic, made me stand back and I thought, was I wrong in saying that? But yet it was kind of sad because she had all these areas where she just didn't want her friend, Jesus, that he would care Mm. about those things. And this is precisely what Teresa is talking about, isn't it? That he does care about everything. That's right. Uh, sometimes 
you know, especially when you're dealing with areas in your life that you don't really want to deal with because they're just so painful and they're embarrassing, they're humiliating to you. And so you want to avoid them with all the strength that you possibly can because who likes to delve into things that are humiliating and embarrassing? And you feel powerless before them too. So what good does it do to kind of go back over this area that I've fallen again and again and again? And I don't seem to be making progress. And you could add to the humiliation and embarrassment. You could add frustration to. It's here in the next chapter, which is one of the most beautiful chapters in the book, insofar as the grace that it tells us about she receives. She starts in the next chapter, and we'll look at this next time, with a technique for prayer that I think I'd like to leave everybody with today. And the technique of prayer that she proposes in this chapter, we need to be aware that we're sinful. We need to be aware that there are things in our lives that Jesus wants to change. But you want to be aware of that more on the periphery. What you want to keep front and center in your prayer is Jesus. And so how do you do that? And what she proposes is she tries to picture Jesus at this stage of her life. She tries to picture Jesus as poor and in need. In fact, she pictures him in the garden at Gethsemane, uh, sweating blood, praying for us, needing our company. And she said she actually practiced this kind of prayer even before she was a nun. And she liked to practice this prayer for an hour before she went to sleep so that she was spending an hour with Jesus in the, in the garden at Gethsemane. You see, if you look at Jesus as the one who thirsts, if you look at Jesus as the one who needs you, sometimes that gives you the courage you need to come before him, even though there's parts of your life that are embarrassing, humiliating, and frustrating. Jesus, who yearns for you, who thirsts for you, he's waiting, and he... Um, understands the humiliation and the embarrassment and the frustration. But he's not discouraged by those things. He has something he yearns to share with you. Something that he needs to say. But he can't say it unless you open the door of prayer and Put yourself in his presence. So you might try this technique of prayer that she invites you to do, where you picture him in poverty, needing you. You picture his face, the glance of his face, beseeching you. And you just spend time with the Jesus, the poor Jesus who needs you. In that space, that is where we will find our courage to pray. It's beautiful. Thank you so much, Anthony. Chris, it's been great being with you. I look forward to our next conversation. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or on whatever platform you obtain your podcasts. There too, you can also listen to an audio version of the complete autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.